Dr. Olshansky, it was a fascinating talk on the placebo effect and uh, also the role of placebos in, you know, doctor-physician, uh, doctor-patient relationship and uh, uh, and it was really enlightening uh, in terms of how we should incorporate the placebo effect in our day-to-day -day practice as physicians. I think uh, that was really good. Um, now, um, you've run so many uh, multi-center uh, trials. Um, what uh, challenges have you faced uh, in the past in running these huge multi-center trials and what do you foresee in the future in terms of big challenges in running these as a trialist? Well, Ash, thank you for your comments and um, uh, the question about um, multi-center trials is a, is a critical one. The reason it's so critical is because so much depends on these trials. They're very expensive um, and we base our guidelines and our uh, patient recommendations on these trials and oftentimes a lot of the therapies that we use um, are based on the results of these trials. The issue, um, however, is that unless they're properly designed, the results may not provide us the kind of information we need. We need to consider the importance of the placebo effect. We need to make sure that there is a proper control. We also have to make sure that the kind of patients that are enrolled in these trials uh, actually represents the patients we see in clinical practice. Because you could do a trial of patients, let's say with functional class three congestive heart failure who continue to get admitted to the hospital uh, and that you're trying to find a therapy, for example, that improves uh, their, their outcomes and functional status, but also reduces the risk of hospitalization or mortality. But the problem is, if you'd have to enroll every single patient, the ones that are the sickest, the ones that don't want to participate, the ones that are non-compliant, the ones uh, that have had the most difficulty, in fact, and maybe at highest risk, are the ones that don't get in the trial. So then you base your information on um, the patients that are potentially the healthiest. And then if you don't have the proper control, um, or if the control effect is so great um, that it may over uh, exceed any benefit um, of uh, the therapy. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. One of them, uh, uh, I don't know where he was here in, I think he was here in Houston, uh, J.T. Willerson? Yes. Um, was involved with the VEGF trial. Mm -hmm. And this was a trial where, you know, there was a vascular endothelial growth factor trial looking at developing new blood vessels uh, in the heart. Um, and it seemed like a reasonable therapy, and there was a lot at stake in this therapy that may actually benefit a lot of people. But when they did the randomized trial against placebo, they found there was no uh, significant benefit, but that the placebo benefit was so huge that it outweighed the benefit of the VEGF. Okay, that's fine. That doesn't mean the VEGF didn't have an effect. It just means that the study needed to be powered properly and that you needed to, to look at the right outcome and that oh, yeah, you had to take into account the importance of the placebo effect. Another example, uh, it was run by, it was by Lame uh, Fanana Pazir, actually uh, basically it, it completely changed his whole career and, and the outcomes of one another therapy that, that never saw the light of day, and this goes back to the 1990s. This was a therapy of pacing for a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy uh, where he looked at ventricular pacing and he showed, uh, as did several other groups, that there was a potential benefit. However, there was a substantial placebo effect and that placebo effect was so huge that it outweighed any specific benefit of the pacing. So, we don't use VEGF, we don't use pacing. Um, is that good or bad? Well, you had to consider the, the adverse effects, but did it really prove that those therapies were no good? Some of the therapies we throw out may have been actually reasonable therapies that may have had a benefit in, tr in, in terms of treating the patient, but the placebo effect is so great that it, 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 it masks that benefit. Or, on the other hand, if you use a therapy without the proper control, then it may look really good and you might use a therapy that might be killing people. And this is critical, for example, in congestive heart failure, there have been many, many trials where uh, therapies have been thrown out left and right. In fact, some of these drugs that have been used initially look like they're very promising. They, they, they save people's lives and, and you know, they uh, prevent hospitalization and they just, they're dramatic. And then when you look at them later on with placebo effects, 
in, 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 in included, you find very little benefit. So this is a critical area because it really has, a, it, it has an impact on how we're going to practice medicine in the future. And the other problem with that is that the cost of those trials is so huge, you have to make sure you design it exactly right so you get the right information properly powered so that you can get the result that, that is appropriate and not what you want to find, but that, that really represents and reflects the value of that therapy independent of a placebo effect. And it's oftentimes harder, uh, especially in industry-sponsored trials, where there is a motivation to begin with to find a positive effect. And uh, with uh, you know, less and less NIH-sponsored trials, it becomes even harder. Right. I mean, you know, there are, there are many trial, there are many issues like that in terms of the deck being stacked in the favor of the drug. And so the study is designed specifically to show a value. And sometimes the studies are very short term and then the patients get placed on the drug for the long term. Or it's a matter of interpretation of how you look at the data and what you consider the outcome. And sometimes, you know, the, the primary outcome all of a sudden changes where someone you know, looks at something else that seems to be significant but it wasn't the design of the study. So when it comes to industry-sponsored uh, studies, you have, to, you have to use a lot of care in looking at what that outcome really means because there's often in, inherent biases. That said, there's always a bias um, in any study. Um, you know, when it comes to, for example, the CAST trial, which looked at you know, uh, uh, antiarrhythmic drugs for PVC reduction versus placebo uh, years ago, that was an NIH-sponsored trial. But the NIH had, had its own, you know, agenda in doing that. So everyone has an agenda. Okay. It's just a matter of what that agenda is. You have to know that agenda. And, and this is why it becomes also important that it may require more than one study to really establish a benefit of a therapy. I mean, we pretty much agree that statins are valuable for, you know, select patients. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we pretty much agree that antihypertensive drugs are valuable. You know, so we've, we, we've learned, you know, with multiple studies so, over time that, that there are certain therapies that, that stand the test of time in multiple studies. Um, so what changes do you predict in sort of the field of electrophysiology going forward, especially in, in this era of, you know, accountable care organizations and, uh, and such? Well, I think the electrophysiologists are in a position right now that's, that's going to become more and more difficult. They've been riding high in, on a lot of very expensive interventions and therapies that appear to be beneficial, but they are unwieldy in terms of cost. And uh, I think with our healthcare system, it, it, it's not going to break the bank, but it's certainly going to make things difficult. So I think they're going to be under the gun of trying to prove that their therapies actually do what they say they're going to do with good outcomes um, and uh, reasonable cost and reasonable safety. So I think the one thing about electrophysiology is it's always been on the cutting edge in terms of technological advancements, which is, is always good. They've always been one step ahead of everyone else in that regard. But I think they're also going to be you know, they're, they're going to be held to, to be accountable for costs and trying to do this in a, in a reasonable, and also uh, what I would say is going to be a, a demonstrably effective way. I think electrophysiologists have gotten away in some ways with uh, uh, not proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that their therapies necessarily improve outcomes. You know, AFib ablation is one example, but I mean, I, I think that it, it does, it is effective in, in some people, but I also think that we, we really should have some definitive studies that, that, that beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt show by some outcome measure that they actually uh, improve outcomes somehow. Do you see that happening in the near future with, uh, uh, you know, placebo-controlled AFib ablation studies? Is there interest in the NIH or otherwise to fund such a thing? I would love to, and I've talked to, to several people about trying to design and, and, and do such a study. Um, I don't see that that's happening. I think, there's, I think from the practitioner point of view, um, and actually there are several electrophysiologists that, that have had kind of an ethical bent. I'm not saying that all of them don't, but that some, of them, some of them are more than others. And, and I've seen them also move more in the direction of doing more ablations and not, uh, you know, even though they had a question about the value, then, then actually wanting to test this because they're, they're, they have a fear uh, that, you know, the profession is based so much on, on these kind of, you know, uh, um, 
procedures that they would hate the procedure to be found to be not exactly what it appears to be on the surface. You know, I think I have to give congratulations to um, uh, some groups in particular, um, such as um, the neurosurgeons who have done studies like, um, uh, they've done more, they've, they've, they've done other studies like this uh, 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 neuronal implant study for Parkinsonism, they've done other studies like this where they've done bl blinded placebo controlled trials. I think in cardiology, if, if we, we really should be ahead of um, you know, uh, groups that, uh, such as CMS and the FDA and other uh, you know, federal organizations that would uh, like to have better, more control, we should be ahead of uh, um, these organizations and show that our therapies have clear-cut value and, and establish that value. Defibrillators, I think, are, are, have, have, have been established to have value at least for certain groups, but I don't think it's been completely understood of where that value would be. I mean, we don't know what to do with people with multiple medical problems who are, are older and various kinds of other groups that have risk for sudden death, but that risk isn't very great. But so I mean, there, I think there's a lot to be learned still. The problem is um, there's less and less money available to do the kind of studies that we need to do, and I don't know who's going to fund it. Mm -hmm. uh, if the federal government would do these large clinical trials, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, you have to resort to um, industry, and then you're, 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 you have bias built into it. And, you know, uh, you've been a pioneer in electrophysiology, you've uh, been chief of EP at Iowa, you've headed multiple clinical trials, and um, if you were to go back, you know, 40 years ago and were to give yourself advice, uh, what would be a couple of things you would change? Uh, Change in, in medicine or change in no in, in, in you know in terms of you know how, what you what you would have done. Uh. Um, hmm. Well, uh, you know, I, I I'm going to share with you um, an interview I did. Uh, I actually sent it to to John, uh, uh, which kind of goes back to before I went to medical school and my goals, uh, but I've always been idealistic. And I always thought when I started in, in this profession that I would be able to have an impact and make a difference and improve what I thought was a profession that was in some ways n not necessarily corrupt, but often had interests outside of what the interest should be. And the main interest is in taking care of our patients the best way we possibly can. That should be our, 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 our number one goal, number two goal, number three goal. And uh, I, I, I've been rather outspoken in the profession, but I, I think more early on and, and, and really have established some of those studies. But I can tell you that th th this is a difficult road. When you, when you start in this profession and you're dealing with a lot of uh, 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 peer pressure and, and, and others that have been in the same position that have, that have challenged some of the, the, the tenants that have been used have had difficult times uh, in doing that. But I would have I would have been more bold than I was, and I'm I'm reasonably bold in what I do. But I would have I would have even been more so. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Olszanski, for coming here, talking to us about the placebo effect, and talking to us today. Uh, it's my pleasure, Ash. Thank you right. very much for having me.